enemy armored platoon is approaching. Three T-90 tanks. A-10 Warhog spots them. An opportunity not to be missed. Having spent its missiles, the A-10 goes for a gun attack. It was literally built around its massive gun, a weapon that can spew massive firepower in mere seconds. With it, the A-10 is often referred to as a tank killer. Yet how would its gun attacks do in today's modern battlefield? Is the big Avenger Gatling gun a liability or the tank buster weapon? And how would those T-90s fare? The A-10 fleet was recently modernized to include secure communications, which are crucial for both military and civilian needs. The latter is why this video is sponsored by NordVPN. It's a virtual private network app. If you're worried that someone might be eavesdropping on your internet data, you can use NordVPN to create a secure channel for your device. It can be a Windows or an Apple macOS computer or an Android or iOS device. Whatever data you send and receive from the internet gets encrypted and sent through one of NordVPN's 5000 plus servers. You get to pick a server you want from any of the 59 countries. Peer-to-peer -peer sharing is allowed, as are multiple connections. There is no data logging and bandwidth is unlimited. NordVPN offers a 30-day money-back guarantee and Binko viewers are getting a special deal. Go to nordvpn.com slash binkov or click the link below the video. Every purchase of a two-year plan will get you one additional month for free. Just enter the code BINKOV. Try it out! The A-10 and its gun go hand in hand. That's because back in 1970, when the need for a combat air support plane was devised, the gun was the centerpiece of the entire platform. In 1972, the YA-10 prototype flew for the first time and won the competition a year later. Deliveries to the Air Force started in 1976. The gun itself was to feature insane firepower. There were 30mm guns on planes before, but the fire rate and muzzle velocity requirements made the Avenger gun what it is. Also, the sustained fire requirements pretty much meant the Gatling option was the only one out there. Perhaps the biggest indication of just how crucial the gun was to the A-10 was the quantity of ammo carried. Where other ground attack aircraft like the Su-25 or Jaguar carried a few hundred rounds, the A-10 carried over a thousand. So much ammo and such a big gun meant a lot was sacrificed in plane design to be able to house everything. But before we go into just how lethal the gun is, uh, let's go over the survivability of the gun. Well, the plane that's carrying that gun. Because if the plane itself can't survive in the battlefield, the gun is worthless. So can the A-10 survive? Well, in 1991 it did quite well. It was hit and damaged often, more so than any other type of plane, but it did fly more missions. Given the fairly low and slow operations that the A-10 was forced to do, the hit rates are not unusual. When one does look at exact sortie numbers and casualty per strike sortie numbers, the overall picture does show the A-10 did pretty well. Important to note, the big difference in casualties per strike sortie is mainly due to exposure to air defenses. The Eagles and Aardvarks flew higher up and used precision weapons. The Warthogs, Intruders and Harriers mostly operated from low or at best medium altitudes. Lost planes per strike sortie, which don't include damaged planes, paints a better picture for the A-10. A damaged plane isn't insignificant, at the very least, it usually means the plane did not perform its mission and it will be out of action for a few days. It can also mean the plane is out of order for the remainder of the war, or that it ultimately gets scrapped. On the other hand, it also means the pilot got home safe and sound. Ejecting over enemy territory usually meant the pilot would get captured. And when it comes to the A-10, some 70% of those damaged planes did go back into action a day later. Unlike most planes, the A-10 was designed to take quite a few hits and survive. It's not that it was all armored, though the cockpit area was literally plated in armor, but it was designed to take damage and keep on flying. The level of subsystem redundancy, fuel line security and general sturdiness is something that to this day has not been attempted on other planes. The plane's internal structure involved novel materials and construction. Where another plane, if its wing was shot full of holes, would suffer that wing crumbling under strain, 
the A10 structure meant that shrapnel would go through, but structural integrity was still high. Anyway, the gun. The main idea was to have very high velocity and heavy rounds, in order to punch through armor. Depleted uranium helped with the weight density requirement. Coupled with the high rate of fire, the actual damage done to a target within the usual second long burst is several times greater than what other attack planes can do. High velocity and high cross-sectional density uh, means the projectiles are quite precise, even over great distances. Allegedly, the gun was corrected during development to have greater round dispersion, as covering a larger area with rounds was seen as important. In Desert Storm, the A-10 would usually fly at 15,000 feet, dropping to 8 or 5,000 feet to visually confirm the target. When performing a gun attack, it would go into a 45 to 60 degree dive. So what damage did those 30 mm hits do to tanks? Well, a burst covered an area with 100 or so rounds. So the targeted tank suffered hits both to areas which are well armored and areas which are not and a whole myriad of subsystems on the tank got damaged or mission neutralized. Yes, there are select areas on modern tanks which offer protection equivalent of almost a thousand millimeters of steel, but such armor is so prohibitively heavy and so thick that only a fairly small area of the tank is protected by such special armor. Most of any tank, Abrams included, is protected by simple steel. Uh, somewhere the armor plates are a bit thicker, in other places they're thinner, but when it comes to the roof, the area is so big that it's impossible to use a lot of armor. Otherwise the tank would weigh literally 100 tons, instead of 60. The frontal half of the turret on Leopard 2, for example, has 70 mm steel plates. The rear half, which still includes the crew area, is just 30 mm thick. The rear area where engine intake is has similar or worse armor protection. The Abrams isn't any better with vast roof surfaces featuring 1 inch thick armor. The Russian T90 features 40 mm of armor on top of its turret. And it's actually the older tanks which have slightly more armor on top of their turrets, mostly due to the cast steel construction method. Various explosive reactive armor plates that sometimes cover modern tanks roofs offer poor protection against multiple hits. Those were designed to defeat a one-off round attack, after which their protection in that area is gone. They can't deal with dozens of rounds hitting nearly the same spot. Figures for the Avenger gun's penetration are estimates from a study on their performance in operations in Bosnia. Similar gun performance figures of the same caliber and muzzle velocity are also offered for comparison. While the A-10, which dives down at a 45 degree angle, might suffer some penetration loss compared to those figures, overall it will still punch through most of the roof area of the turret and rear hull of pretty much any tank. At worst, only the initial rounds in the salvo, those fired from a greater distance, might not penetrate. There were tests performed in late 1970s, where an A-10 used its gun on M-47 tanks and some Soviet D-62s. The goal was to see if even low-angle attacks, without diving down on target, were effective. While from such angles penetration was less likely, it still did occur. The sides of the tank or the back of the tank and the turret are also not completely covered in heavy armor, even in modern tanks. While most hits did not penetrate, they still severely damaged exterior suspension components. The studies concluded that 11 to 27 direct hits are enough to destroy a tank. Of course, that was then. Today's tanks, or even T-72s, are sturdier, which is partly why during the Gulf War A-10s did prefer attacking in a dive. Still, even if it takes a few more hits and a few more rounds fired, it's almost assured that any modern tank would be mission killed when accurately targeted by the A-10's gun in a dive. So what is the actual verdict? Is the gun a tank killer? Yes, by all means. But the A-10, as a combat system, may not be. When the A-10 was made, in the 1970s, engaging armored vehicles with a gun seemed like a good idea. Precision hits by missiles were not really viable then. The A-10 could afford to loiter over the battlefield and do multiple strafing runs. Tactical anti-air defenses were crude then, seldom with radars or capable anti-aircraft missiles. By the end of the Cold War, 
not only were there more and more tactical SAM systems featuring longer range and bigger missiles, but all aspect attack shoulder launched missiles were proliferating at a staggering pace. While such missiles had tiny warheads, often unable to actually down an A-10, they could still do serious damage. In short, the number of threats to the A-10 in a given area skyrocketed several fold by the 1990s. So much so that in the Desert Storm the following happened. The US achieved total air superiority. A-10s had to worry only about ground-based threats from systems that were technologically 10 or 20 years behind. Yet the majority of A-10s attacks were not performed with guns, but with guided missiles from somewhat safe ranges of up to 6 miles away. Nearly all Maverick missiles used in 1991 were fired by A-10s. The A-10s also regularly used various bombs in that conflict. Overall, they did kill a lot of enemy targets. Exact figures do differ from source to source. Some seem to count various target types twice, and some equate targets attacked with targets killed. Now those are claims. Basically a pilot sees a detonation and concludes the target is destroyed, while in fact the damage to the target may not be as severe. After the war, the US DOD compared the pilot's claims with actual damage on the ground done by post-battle inspection. Two studies were made, one suggesting that only a third of reported tank kills were indeed kills, and another suggesting one half of the A-10's tank kills were valid. Yes, the A-10 did a lot of sorties in the Gulf War, but it wasn't the only plane by a long shot. And when it comes to tank hunting, the F-111 actually did a lot of kills as well. But it did its kills by using advanced targeting systems from high above to find targets, and laser guide its bombs to those vehicles. That explains why the F-111 pilot's claims turned out to be more accurate. When a big bomb goes off, chances are higher it will indeed kill the vehicle. F-111 is credited with some 1500 armored vehicle kills. Sadly, a more exact breakdown is not available. Using pilot claims the A-10s may have killed some more armored vehicles overall. But even if those killed close to 2000 armored vehicles, the number of missions A-10s flew was pretty high. F-111s did 2400 sorties against Iraqi ground forces. Taking the sortie number and killed armored targets into account, the A-10 still killed more armored vehicles. But if those numbers are adjusted for actual post-battle inspection damage, the A-10's performance isn't as good. And crucially, the majority of those armored kills, especially against tanks, were not done by its gun. So sorties needed to achieve gun kills would likely be several times higher. Basically, even back in the 1991, the US Air Force stopped trusting the A-10's gun to do the demanding missions. Back then, in the 1990s, there was some merit to having the A-10 do missile strikes. Targeting pods were expensive, not numerous, and their identification range versus a vehicle was maybe 5 miles. Today, they are cheaper, much more numerous, and their range is roughly tripled, thanks to better image stabilization and better thermal sensors. So a much broader range of jet types can perform those tank-busting missions, be it with missiles or with guided bombs. Miniaturization has led to some truly small form yet high-performance weapons, where a plane can easily hold 8 or 16 such weapons, compared to 6 Mavericks A-10s usually carried in 1991. The A-10 as a platform is soldiering on. The US Air Force has invested considerable money to manufacture new wings for most of the fleet, digitize it and add precision targeting abilities. Today's A-10s have data links, use targeting pods and a variety of guided bombs. In a way, they are more lethal than ever. But the added lethality hasn't come from the gun. If anything, the gun is even less significant today than it was in 1991, when most of the work against armor was done by Maverick missiles. The US Air Force has had a love-hate relationship with the plane. On one hand, they do acknowledge it's cheap to operate, unlike the F-35 for example. It's rugged and is often flown from forward bases as it doesn't need much support. That means it can get to the battlefield quickly and patrol over the battlefield for longer. Yet during the last 10 years, there have been several attempts by the Air Force to retire the plane. Every time the Air Force would try that, Congress would step in and say no due to their own interests. 
The latest attempt was in 2020, but Congress mandated a budget for the plane until 2021. While the Warthog's future isn't sure, the future of its mighty Avenger gun seems to be barely existent. In very specific conflicts, where the US will have near total control of the air and the A-10s will be able to freely fly low and close to the enemy, less important targets might be worthy of a strafing ground. But against the high cost and high risk targets, guided weapons will be used. The gun that was once designed to deal with Soviet armor has been relegated to support duty and counterinsurgency low intensity conflicts. Still, it will likely remain in history books as the last and best of its kind. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together. <laughs>